John Mellencamp's music has made countless hits, a Grammy win, and more than 40 million albums sold worldwide. And in his decades-long career, the iconic singer-songwriter has stayed true to his heartland roots, making him the Norman Rockwell of the music industry. And now he's gearing up for the release of his 22nd full-length album, Plain Spoken, and he has a 2015 tour in the works. And he joins us now to discuss his upcoming projects and all things rock and roll. Good to see you, sir. How you doing? I am excited about this album. Excited to have you here. 22nd album. What, what, what made this one come about? Well, I got to remember, too, when I started making records in 1974, oh, before you were born. <laughs> what year were you born? 78. There you go. Uh, you know, the idea of, of a lifelong career making albums was just like, you know, you make a couple records and that was it. Yeah. So the idea to be 62 years old and still making records is like, hmm, didn't really plan on that, but I'm glad it worked out that way. Yeah, it's been an amazing journey. And it, it's been an interesting one because typically when people embark on a decades long career, you know, you were 21, 22 when you made your first record, mm -hmm. uh, they do it by making pop hits the whole way. Right. Whereas in, in many ways, your, your career is a story of two different halves, right? There's this part where you're making these amazing pop hits and then you, you made a turn. Well, I get, you know, um, I had to do that because, you know, there were so many people, you know, all the slots were full by the time that I started making records. You know, there were a lot of singer-songwriters hmm. at the time. Lots, lots. And so there was, you know, for me to be able to uh, have a place, I had to do something that was undeniable, which is like, you know, I've got to write these songs that connect with people and that uh, uh, can get on the radio. And so there's certain things that had to happen. So, you know, we knew that. And so that's what we did. But then, you know, it got to be not a nice ride. So mm -hmm. I decided to take the bumpy road about 1988 and kind of been bumping down that road ever since. Yeah, so I wasn't sure, I always wondered, was it a means to an end sort of thing where I wanna make a certain kind of music but I need the pop hits to get in the door or if you actually pivoted because, as you just said, this, this pop thing isn't as all it's cracked up to be. A little bit of both, probably. Mm -hmm. Very insightful for a guy born in 1970. <laughs> there, there are a few of us. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it was probably a little bit of both. You know, I wrote a song, I think it was it came out in 89 called pop singer, yes. and uh, a lot of people were like, John Mellencamp's biting the hand that feeds him, and you know, music was all different then, you know, um, wasn't computers, there wasn't uh, all these games, there wasn't uh, uh, so much to entertain people, so music was it, I mean, you know, music identified who you were by who you listened, and what you listened to, and what you liked, and the songs you related to, the concerts you went to, uh, the way the Apple stores are full now, yeah, that was record stores. Oh, yeah. I mean, you couldn't even get into Tower Records at night. You know, I couldn't wait to get to Los Angeles to go to Tower Records to look at, because they had like, you know, 50,000 titles. Oh, I loved it. The first time I bought of yours, uh, I think it was in 94, uh, when Wild Night was your single. I think that was, I, I, I bought it at Tower Records at 12.01 on a Tuesday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now I can just click on stuff for your last time. I just clicked on it, but yeah. I mean, you know, that song right there, I, I'm, I was working with a, with a little girl named uh, Michelle Indigo Cello. Oh, yeah. And, um, uh, we were just getting sounds in the studio. And uh, I said, you know that song, Wild Night? She goes, no, I don't know. She never heard it. So my guitar player started playing it, and, and I started singing it just to get sounds in the studio. And she started playing her bass, and she came up with this wild bass part. And we all thought it was cute. And that was it. Yeah. We put it away. Months later, we were mixing the record. And it was stuck that somebody had recorded, the engineer had recorded us just messing around. And as he was setting up the mix for the song we were doing, he goes, have you heard this uh, thing you guys were just messing around with? And I said, no. He played it for me, we thought it was great. Put it out, it was number one record. Yeah. Well, total accident. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Total accident. Did you feel a little guilty? Did you feel like you backslid a little bit? Because you know, around 88 when you make Pop Singer, you're saying, okay, I, this isn't for me. Then all of a sudden you remake a Van Morrison hit and it makes it to the, you know, near the top of the charts. I mean, that's a big deal. It didn't make it, to, it, was, oh. it was number one. Right, right, yes, <laughs> made number one, yes. It was number one. Uh, we thought it was funny. Yeah. We thought it was funny. Well, I think really uh, in retrospect, you know, when I look at it now, it just shows what a great song that was yeah. and how inventive her bass playing was. So I take very little credit for it because I was just, you know, 
getting a vocal sound. <laughs> I, I wouldn't, uh, okay, yeah, I'll sing this song. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that people take your music up the way you want it taken up? For example, uh, even, even obviously Jack and Diane's what everyone asked you about, I'm sure a million times, but when I, hear about, when I hear the way people read that song and understand that song and what it meant to people, it seems, sounds very different than the way I've heard you describe it. Well, originally, uh, the line was, uh, Jack was not a football star. Jack was an African-American. Hmm. And in 1982, you know, when I turned the song into the record company, they went, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> can't you make him something other than that? <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. And I said, well, I don't really want to. I mean, that's the whole point. This is a, a, really a, a song about, you know, uh, about race relationships and, you know, a white, cup, a white girl being with a, with a black guy. And that's what's really what the song's about. And this is, and, no, 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 no. <laughs> so anyway, too much debate and me being young, I said, okay, we'll make him a football star. <laughs> Do you regret it now? Uh, no, because I think Jack and Diane became, I don't know, but as near as I could tell, the most popular couple in, rock, in music, in that genre of music. I mean, yeah. what other two people can you say? In that? Right. You don't think it would have been that big of a hit if it had been like uh, Leroy and Diane? I don't know. Kute and Diane. <laughs> maybe, maybe it doesn't have the same ring. Yeah, the same. It just didn't have the same thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so it's funny how those, we've talked about two experiences and both were kind of accidents. Well, this time was much more intentional, right? I mean, the last two albums in particular, um, this most recent album, uh, let's start with, um, you were very deliberately more reflective, more introspective. You made a decision to talk about you. Well, uh, um, really, uh, I'm very fortunate that uh, I've been writing for a long time and I'm really channeling. Hmm. You know, I don't, I, I, you know, I know you've probably heard that a million times, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I really, I'm really out of my own way. Okay. You take a song like Isolation of Mister that's on this new record, it's not really about me so much, it's about men, hmm. you know, and how men make decisions of uh, this is how it's going to be, and God damn it, that's what I said, you know, this is what I said, you know, and yeah. it's what I meant. And then you get to be a certain age and you go, oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> I should have. I shouldn't have done that. Well, wow. and so I think that th that is the basis. But basically, that song was when I wrote that song. I couldn't write fast enough because it was just coming to me, and my mind is open. I mean, I'm sure that you have thoughts, and you go, "Hey, that'd make a great song." Yeah. But then you let go of it. Exactly. And th that. But see, I haven't been let. I haven't let go of it in years. So you know, my mind is open to those ideas, to develop those ideas, and not just go, "Oh, that's a good idea." Let's see if it's a good idea. And then, when I was younger, I used to get in the way of those songs. What does it mean to get in the way of the song? Oh, I tried to put John Mellencamp in there. Uh, no, John Mellencamp wants it to go this way. Forget you guys who are sending it to me. I'm going to do this. And so you take a song like, you know, one of my hits is uh, a song called Pink Houses. And I hear that song on the radio, and I, was, I can tell that I was out of my own way the first two verses. Mm. But the last verse, I got involved. I should have just kept, kept letting it come to me and yeah. just write it down. But the last verse is not, not that good. And it could, and probably what was being channeled to me, I should have just got out of the way of. Some people call channeling inspiration, but I, you know, I feel like it has nothing to do with me. So if I see you after I do these 80 shows, I'll be able to tell you what the songs are about. But right now, your guess is as good as mine because I really take no credit for them. Wow, that's interesting because when I heard Trouble Man in particular, um, I thought that was you. I, it felt like um, you were reflecting on life. That well, you. Let me ask you a question. What are you like, forty something? Well, Thirty-eight, thirty-six. Okay, it's you too. Hmm. Yeah, that, that was the scary part. By the by, by the end of the song, I was really kind of scared. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it, it's you too. I mean, it's it, 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 it's about being a man. A lot of this record, this plain spoken, is talking to 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 men. Yeah. And talking to uh, young men, old men, and, you know, admitting uh, who we really are and, and what we really represent and what our job is and how seriously we take it or if we just gave up and said to hell with it. Well, sometimes there's a God. Sometimes there's God. Sometimes there's God in someone else's eyes. You know that feeling. Yeah. You know. 
you look at somebody's eyes and man, woman, doesn't matter, and you think, oh my God. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, if a woman has a child that's autistic or dies at birth or something, you know, you think there's not a God. Yeah. Matter of fact, I, 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 I just I have a friend who, cuss, who cursed God because her cat died. Wow. I mean, so people really take it to, you know, so sometimes there's God and sometimes there's not. Yeah. And that's really what the song is about. It's not really anything about my belief in God or, I know, I know, you know, I, I know what I believe, but yeah. what I believe doesn't really matter. Yeah. I thought it was more about despair. I, I read it as, as sort of how you deal with despair in those moments where you feel there isn't God, right? And I was, so what I wondered was, have you, how do you deal with those moments? How do you deal with those moments where you're not sure? You've had, you've had rough experiences. You've had things in life that didn't work out. How, how do you deal with those moments? I dance. Really? Yeah. Huh. You should dance. Everybody knows that. When you are unhappy, dance. When you have troubles, dance. And after that energy goes through you of dancing, then you can sit down and not make a knee-jerk reaction. But dance. Hmm. Dance until you can't dance anymore, until you're exhausted. And then sit down and make your decision. Don't ever, you know, I've done it so many times. I've made decisions of, oh, God, I'm going to, you know, because I'm kind of a gruff know-it-all sometimes, <laughs> you know, and make these big decisions like that. But I've learned that, you know, I got troubles. I dance. Wow. A beautiful thing to do. There's some people who want to dance with you right now in the HuffPost Live community. I want to bring in uh, some folk who had questions or comments. Uh, Justin is the first person. Justin actually had a video that he left. Uh, he considered you an inspiration. Let's, let's take a look. Hi, John. This is Justin Sewer from Floyd's Knobs, Indiana. I've heard you mention your grandparents a number of times uh, in interviews and even in some of your music. What do you appreciate most about your grandparents? Well, I was very fortunate. I had... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I had a grandmother who, uh, I was born with a spina bifida, which is a uh, disease, not a disease, but a, 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 a growth on the back of my neck as a baby the size of a man's fist. And my mom was very young, so she just kind of took me and went, here, to my grandmother. Even though, you know, my mom and dad lived right behind my grandparents. So my grandmother raised me, and for my entire life, my grandmother told me, buddy, you're the handsomest boy in the world, buddy. You're the fastest boy in the world, buddy. You're the smartest boy in the world. Don't ever forget it. Don't forget that. Don't forget this. Don't forget that. Don't forget that that you that that you can. You're better than that. And so she was trying to. You know, she talked to me in that way. And I was 20 years old, and she would say, "Buddy, you know, don't forget. You're the most talented boy in the world." And you know, after a kid hears that, so many times. You kind of go, well, maybe, but there's a part of you that actually believes it. So positive reinforcement in my life yeah. with a kid who should have been dead uh, was very valuable to me. Were there ever, are there ever moments where you still doubt that? Doubt what? That you are smart, talented, etc. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, because some sort I mean, if I asked Kanye West that, he'd say, hell no. You know, I mean, I, I, everybody's different. Are, no, are there no, moments? No, 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 no. Listen, I... I see through, uh, I, 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 I see, uh, I have a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I can look at a mirror and I go, who the hell's that old guy? <laughs> you know, that's terrible being a decrepit old bag of bones. I get it, I yeah. get it. But I, I, as a young man, it, it was very valuable. Uh, and I think that people who have children need to have positive reinforcement as well as, you know, I mean, you have to, kids have to be disciplined, of course. Yeah. But uh, if I was ever in trouble, with my parents, I knew where I was going. Mm. Grandma's house. Right. Because nothing bad was going to happen Grandparents there. are amazing people. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. I'm going to grandma's house. Exactly. Very smart. Comment, a question coming in from the HuffPost Live community, but Linda writes in and asks, singer, songwriter, artist, writer, actor, director, what, if anything, have you not done that you would like to try your hand at? Uh, I would, I'm still uh, trying to write better songs trying to get to a point where I feel like uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, uh, just being able to connect with you. I don't know you, you don't know me, but if there's a moment in Troubled Man where you go, wow, that's what you want to do. 
Now, could a guy actually do that with a bunch of songs? I, I don't know. Maybe, but that's my goal. Wow, that's a heck of a goal. You're also writing musicals. Yeah. There's this thing with Stephen King, right? Yeah. Talk to me about that. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a gothic, it, it's an interesting mix of things that I didn't see coming, once again. Well, it's not Jack and Diane meet Cujo. <laughs> Now, Steve, Steve is a wonderful guy, uh, and he is as uh, common as common can be, and I, I consider myself very common. Yeah. And uh, he lives in Maine, I live in Indiana, and uh, the best thing about, uh, 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 one of my favorite things about uh, Ghost Brothers of Darkland County is that Steve King has become like this wonderful friend. Uh, I, I have a very hard time collaborating with people. I don't play well with other kids. <laughs> You know, so uh, yeah. Steve and I, and Steve doesn't either, but we were able to be together, and we've been working on it 15 years, and it's going back out on tour, and uh, I wrote all the songs, and Steve wrote the story from a story that I told Steve, and uh, it's a, uh, it's somewhere between, uh, this is a lofty, somewhere between uh, uh, Tennessee Williams and Stephen King. He was able to bridge the two together because it's about a family and a, a, a family in disarray and, and they're in trouble. And then ghosts come and move them around and then there's a Stephen King ending. Yeah. Which, <laughs> we know what that means, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. You, you just described yourself as ordinary. Right. Um, you also live in Indiana. You don't live like in Indianapolis. You're like in Bloomington. I'm in Bloomington. That, I mean, I, I live on 86 acres by myself. I take great delight in my own company. <laughs> Clearly, if you're in Bloomington, Indiana, you have to take delight in your own company. Yeah, I take delight in my own company. Why? Not, not why you take delight in your own company. Why do you make the decision to be so, I almost want to call it reclusive. Um, I think that uh, I'm better off that way. I'm, I'm, I, 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 like I come to New York and, uh, you know, I hadn't heard a horn honk in months mm. since the last time I was here. You know, you go to Bloomington, nobody honks horn. If you, if you go to Bloomington and you start honking your horn, you're going to get ass kicking. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, it's rude. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. I mean, I've seen people jump out of their cars and fist fight over that. Yeah. But here it's like common. So I notice all of these little things that you guys just, you know, once you live here, you just... Take for granted. Yeah, you just hear it, and you go, oh, you don't even have to hear it. But I drove into town today, and I heard a horn honk, and I go, whoa! That's the first horn I've heard honk in three or four months, yeah. since I was here last time, probably. So those things affect me differently than they do you. You know, I see people on the street, I see... I, I, I don't know, I just, uh, I'm too, and this sounds funny, but I'm too... street and go, hmm. or not, not you don't care, but you've seen it a million times. I haven't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't see it where I live. Yeah. It's not in my house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I don't, I, I, you know, I paint and I write, yeah. and that's, that's what I do. So and that all takes place in my house or my recording studio. Did, did, um, did the industry make you, or, or not just the industry, did your life experiences make you into the guy who wants to be on his acres in Bloomington, or is that the guy who you were all the time? I was probably that way to begin with, uh, uh, and uh, I have always operated on the outside of the music business, never wanted to be part of it, never got along with any record company that I was ever with, uh, never liked self-promotion, never, uh, never liked any of that. All I, would, all I really wanted to do was, was write songs and go play them. Yeah. And then videos were invented, and I had to make videos. I never liked doing that. And I just, I just, uh, you know, now the music business is so far away from what it started out to be yeah. when I got involved. Don't forget, music in the beginning was, uh, at least rock and roll music, before that was big band music. Right. Uh, you know, uh, so when I started, it was for teenagers and rebellious. Yeah. It was a rebellion. Now it's like, you know, how many records did he sell, blah, blah. And it's all this commercial. I don't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. My, my records, plain spoken, is a calling card. That's all it is, just a calling card. So that's the way I look at it. And I've always operated on the outs outside of, 
of the music business. Never wanted to be part of it. Never wanted to. I say it in that song, pop song. Never wanted to have a manager over for dinner. Right. You know, I didn't want to hang out after the shows. So I'm just, I'm just not. That's not what, what I'm here to do. So there's the not wanting to be part of the business, but then there's also the not wanting to be famous. I hate that. that it seems like you hate both. I, I, I hate it. Yeah. Is it, it? You know, applaud. You know what the word applause means? Hmm. Applause is taken from the word. I can't remember the exact Latin word, but it, it means to praise the gods. Hmm. What? What? We applaud me doing a song. People want to take my picture because I sang a song. It never made any sense to me. It made me feel funny. Hmm. Have you ever been embarrassed? Oh, yeah. Well, every time somebody ever put a camera on me, particularly when I was young, embarrassed the hell out of me. Wow. I just couldn't take it. It was just like, don't, don't do that. Hmm. I, I felt, and then, it, then I became a hostile about it. Well, I was going to ask you about that because fans read that differently than you may intend it. I don't mean you personally, oh, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm sure you can imagine because the first thing a, f- a fan thinks is, this guy won't take a picture of me. I just bought his album. He's a jerk or she's a jerk. Yeah, yeah. Whereas you might actually be intimidated or scared or uncomfortable or all these, or maybe just had a bad day. I mean, there's all these other things that could have happened. How do you negotiate that with fans? Well, now, you know, uh, <laughs> Willie Nelson taught me a, let- uh, taught, taught me a lesson in 1985. Uh, <clears throat> we had just introduced the first farm aid and as soon as the, the, we did it in this huge football stadium and there was all these, all this press and all these people and Willie and I came to the, uh, to the place together and I go get in the vehicle to leave <clears throat> and he didn't come back. I sat there, 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 I thought. Finally, here comes Nelson and I go, you've been gone a half hour, where the hell did you go? What have you been doing? He goes, something you should think about doing. And I said, yeah, what's that? He goes, taking care of your fans. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, oh, yeah, maybe. (laughs) Maybe he's got something there. But what he was doing was was signing autographs and talking to people. And I just, you know, it never dawned on me to do that. Yeah. And, And but now you'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I try to be polite to people as much as I can. Wow. Well. Well, let's see here. Uh, Suk Hayes writes in and says, uh, what would it take to share a beer with you when you're in Vancouver? Suk, I'm not sure he's in beer territory yet. We got him signing up. Willie Nelson got him signing up. He's <laughs> shaking hands. I'm not sure. We... I, have, I haven't been drunk since 1971. Really? I haven't touched You're doing this rock and roll thing all wrong, man. I, I'm, I've been missing it. <laughs> you're really uh, I, I, I never, I never, uh, I never. I, last time I got drunk, I got the hell beat out of me, and I just thought, you know, this drugs and alcohol thing's not working for me. Wow. Because you know those guys turn into real. I don't know if I can say this word, but you know, you real, can. real pricks. Yeah. 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 Put a little bit of alcohol into me, and not a good guy. No. That's fair enough. You also gave up smoking. No. You, 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 I still smoke. Oh, you did. Someone told me you smoke five packs a day and stop. No, no, no. I used to smoke a lot more than I do, but I still smoke. I didn't oh. think I got this voice. <laughs> I, was, I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy when I was making this record because we started mixing it. And I thought, after two million cigarettes, it's finally paid off. I'm starting to sound like a black guy. <laughs> That's all it took. Yeah, just two million cigarettes, and I got rid of that little high voice I had and got some gravel in it. A couple more years, you'll be Louis Armstrong out here. Yeah, man. I'll be like that. <laughs> There's some fans who want to ask you some questions there in the HuffPost Live community. First one up is Allison Bresnick. Hey, Allison. Hi. So I know you kind of touched on this earlier about collaborating, but if you could sit down and play music with any artist, alive or dead, who would it be? Uh, probably uh, Woody Guthrie or uh, Bob Dylan. Ooh. And, and uh, I've done, Bob and I've done tours together. Uh, matter of fact, Willie... It was Willie, me, and Bob. We did two summers together. And, uh, and so, yeah, that would be the only people I'd be interested in working with. Wow. Touring is another thing. I mean, you've got a big tour coming up. You're going to do 80 shows soon. Mm-hmm. I, how do you get the legs for that after going from sort of being away from the spotlight altogether to having to be on the road that much? Well, when you're on the road, you know, uh, it, it, the world just becomes very small. Yeah. Because you do the same thing every day and, you, you know, you, everything's planned out for you. I mean, you know, I'm 62 years old, and you know, I can't check into a hotel. I don't know how to do that. If really? I if I had to check into a hotel, I'd be screwed. Wow. 
I've never written a check. You know, I, I wouldn't write a check. How do you do that? I, you know, I've never done any of that stuff. How, do you feel like you missed a part of your life? No, I'm glad I missed it. <laughs> I don't want to stand in line. I don't want to write checks. I don't want to check into hotels. I don't want to put gas in my car. I don't like that stuff. It's, it's just, it's just. Oh, I love you, man. That's the most honest answer anyone's ever given. Because everyone always says, oh, I wish I could see how everyday people, you know, standing in line is overrated, you know? No, 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 no. I, I, live, I live there. I see it, you know. I, I, live, I live in the middle of nowhere, you know. So I see what people do. I see what the average person has to go through. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't you ain't that. missing much, bro. I, yeah, I promise. I don't want to do that. There's, the, there's no reward in suffering, you know. <laughs> Point taken. Allison, you had a second question uh, coming up, didn't you? Um, sure. Um, well, originally I was going to ask about Jack and Diane, but you kind of explained that. Um, but I guess touching on music today, if, if there was someone in the music industry today who you think has the most promising kind of long-lasting career like yours, who do you think it would be? Well, I'd probably have to say Jack White. Oh, I would say Jack White is a creative guy. He he knows his he knows rock history. He's he's thinking outside the box. His his songs are are uh, he just played Farm Aid and I, I think he kind of stole the show, uh, which I was very happy to see. Uh, I think Neil got him to come and play and and uh, probably Jack White. Uh, you just mentioned Farm Aid. Um, talk to me why Farm Aid is so important to you. Well, we started Farm Aid in 1985, and at the time, you know, I was maybe 30 or something. I don't know how old I was. Willie was a pretty young guy. Neil was young. I mean, Neil was young. Yeah, Neil, Neil young. <laughs> <laughs> so he still is Neil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Neil was a young guy, and, uh, and we, th we actually thought that, you know, we would have this concert, and what we were really, what I was really interested in was that, you know, I would see all these small towns going out of business, and I yeah. couldn't really figure out why until I put together that the small American farmer was going out of business. And so all these small communities that had, you know, like a bank and a, and a, a grocery store and not a supermarket, but a grocery store owned by a family, all these things were disappearing back in the early to mid 80s. And I would see these ghost towns. And uh, so when I figured out that it was connected to farming, then we started, I started looking at, you know, uh, that's when I wrote a song called Rain on the Scarecrow. And I started looking at, you know, well, how many farms, are, how many family farms are going out of business? Then you realize all the politics that are involved with farming, and how uh, the price of this is used to embargo, and this is that, and you know, and these people are really used the small American farmer. But then you have these huge companies that are really dreadful, big corporations that. Mm -hmm you know, feed us, basically the food is grown here and driven 150,000 miles away for us to eat. And, you know, that's why, I you know, I'm convinced that's why, why do we see many, so many bald people, young guys now? It's the food we eat, you know? It's, uh, there's so many things that we're doing to ourselves because of this processed food, this genetically engineered food. Uh, Congress is, you know, in bed with, with big agriculture. Oh yeah, you know. So uh, you know. So what do we do? Like, wh yeah. Here's what. Here's what I think we should do. I got a solution. You want to hear my solution? Yeah. A president can have four terms. If you're a senator, you got four years, and it's an honor to represent your constituency and your area. Yeah. But after four years, you're done. Yeah. So you know, if I lived in your neighborhood and and I was your congressman, I had to do what you people said because it's an honor. You people are the people who put me there, yeah. and and that's what it pretends to be. But there's all these special interests. So special interests then are all of a sudden gone. Yeah. You have a president that has enough time to get something accomplished and something done. I think Roosevelt had four terms, didn't he? Yeah, he was the last person to have. Yeah, yeah. Franklin Roosevelt was the last guy. You know, I think we should go back to that, and we should go back to. Four years for a senator, four years for a, a congressman, and I think we'd see a huge change in, in our society. Wow. Before you go, talk to me about this Saturday, because there's a big performance coming up. There is. There is. It's a special performance this Saturday. It's a special live performance at your recording studio in Bloomington, Indiana. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> It'll be uh, on Access TV and on iHeartMedia. Uh, yeah, we're going to do this 
this live performance uh, in my studio with uh, people sitting around and try to make it very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, kind of like a town hall type of thing where people are actually, you know, if I'm playing guitar, you're sitting right there next to me. Yeah. If you feel like singing, sing. If you don't, don't, you know, that wow. kind of thing. That's pretty neat. You know, a lot of classic rock stations all around the country uh, will be picking this up, so I'm sure your local uh, rock station will have this. It's going to be pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun, man. And so will this tour, so is everything, man. You got, you're on a, you, I, I like where you're going. I think you're going to be a big star one day, man. <laughs> just keep it together. Hang in there. If I, could just, if I could just keep it together. There you right? go, man. If you want to make this guy a big star, get a copy of Plain Smoking. It's his newest album. It's 22nd album. It's going to be released tomorrow, Tuesday, September 23rd. If you want to learn more about the album, the tour, or John's story career, you can click the links in our resource well below. Thanks for watching HuffPost Live. Stay with us. Thanks. All right, buddy. <laughs>